wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, fun to fun to get people in. Howdy. Hey, hello, hello how everybody. We, how we doing? Hey, there's my friend Ed Wilson from North Carolina. Amy Lucky, the uh, the mayor of Big Fork. Uh, hello, Amy. We really don't have a mayor of Big Fork because um, Margaret's <laughs> really kind of the mayor of Big Fork too. It's an unincorporated city, so everybody's really the mayor. Um, we have a lot of folks joining us, so we'll uh, do a little bit of kibitzing as we um, uh, as we get uh, going. Doug Mitchell here. I have the privilege of being your host tonight and the executive director of the Glacier Conservancy. Um, such a treat to have people uh, join us from all over the country. Um, as I said, we have North Carolina. I see uh, Mary is, uh, is there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania tonight. Thanks for uh, being with us. It's, uh, it's neat to see um, so many new faces as well. Um, this was our most popular program. We had 120 people uh, registered for this evening to share the evening with uh, Jordan Fisher Smith, who's joining us tonight from uh, from beautiful Nevada City, California. Um, there is actually a mayor on the line. Uh, the, he'll always be my mayor of Great Falls, uh, Randy Gray and his uh, bride Nora. Thank you for for joining us um, again tonight. Um, we are really um, looking forward to being able to share this time with somebody who has helped us think very deeply about. Um, this issue of what it means to manage the, the two very um, uh, compelling and differentiated requirements in the single sentence of the Organic Act, which is, uh, you know, keep it exactly the way it is and let three million people in, uh, <laughs> which is it's the conundrum that we deal with uh, each and every day at the, at the Glacier Conservancy and, and the book Engineering Eden uh, does such a great job of kind of giving us both the history of that and and the real on the ground, um, real on the ground, uh, you know, uh, knowledge that Jordan brings not only as a a seasoned journalist writer but also because of his history. So again, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're going to spend about an hour tonight talking about engineering Eden. Those of you who've done this before, feel free to just raise your hand or shout out a question or use the chat feature um, to do that. Um, you know, again, I'm Doug Mitchell of the Conservancy, my uh, co-workers, uh, partners in crime, Jill Bridgman, Emily Evans, uh, and uh, Ella Hutchison tonight are with us. Jill helps us with the, um, uh, with the questions. So feel free to, at any point, uh, put questions in the chat and we'll be able to deal with those. But I wanna just take a minute and introduce uh, Jordan to you. Um, I've gotten to know him over the past couple of months. He uh, generously took my crazy call, I don't know what Jordan, in October or November of last year, um, talking about the book club and that we were looking to continue it for next year and just right away said said yes. And, and so Jordan Fisher Smith, our guest tonight, author of uh, this amazing book, Engineering Eden, not his first book. Um, he wrote his first book, Nature Noir, which was a Wall Street Journal summer reading selection and a San Francisco Chronicle best book of 2005 uh, book. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later and comes to his writing um, with a background as a, as a ranger, um, both for, well, not both for the park service for California state parks and also for the forest service in California, Wyoming, Idaho and Alaska, I believe. Um, and since, since changing to being a writer has won and been nominated for all sorts of awards uh, and is written in Men's Journal, New York, <laughs> New Yorker, Discover, um, also been involved in documentary films, one of which Under Our Skin um, was shortlisted for the 2010 Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. Um, so uh, this is a guy who was not short of, of accomplishments um, and a really interesting uh, perspective on our, on our national park. So Jordan Fisher Smith, welcome to uh, to the Glacier Book Club. Thank you, Doug. This is just such a wonderful thing. I've never seen uh, an online book club and certainly not of this size. And uh, uh, what a great opportunity for people from all over to bond with, with Glacier. Well, you'll learn that we're not a shy bunch uh, around here. And so um, I, I wanted to kind of kick it off by, by asking about your journey. Um, you know, we, we all of us are glacier lovers and some people in, on, on the, the um, Zoom tonight, you know, have experience working in the park. And so you, 
you went from 21 years of being on the ground in parks to writing about that. Tell us about your journey from park ranger to author or journalist. Well, you know, I, I would venture a guess that a lot of people with us tonight came, came to their love of Glacier and other national parks through some childhood experience. I'll bet you that a lot of us here went to a park with their parents or had some kind of an outdoor experience that where they just bonded uh, with, with uh, nature and with the national parks. And it's certainly true for me. My parents um, were European immigrants and they were, uh, you know, my dad was from the Moors in Northern England and, and my mother from, you know, the mountains of, of uh, central Germany. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, they walked, they knew how to walk and they, and they were interested in going out on foot and going places. So I think, you know, to begin with, once I figured out that I was, uh, wanted to be a ranger, probably age 21, 22, that's all I, I wanted to do. And I threw myself at being a ranger in the same way and now throw myself at writing, you know, with pretty total commitment. And um, so I was well into my career when in 1986 or 87, I started reading seriously about the, uh, the uh, science of climate change. And I distinguished that from the politics of climate change. I was just reading about, you know, the Keeling curve, which already existed, things like that. And, uh, and so by 1988 or so, when Al Gore was running for president on more or less a uh, climate change ticket, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, climate change platform, let's say. Uh, I was beginning to go into kind of a crisis about what I was doing. I had become a law enforcement ranger. My theory was that we would protect, you know, re at the risk of our lives, these special places and then hand them on to the next generation. And right around that time, I found myself working in these canyons, beautiful canyons in the north and middle fork of the American River. Uh, 48, 50 miles of, of, of gorgeous canyons that couldn't be expected to be there in five years. And at the same time, the whole world around me now was, uh, uh, you know, with climate change, we really couldn't know what was going to be here in, in 25 or 50 years. And I started to kind of have a crisis of the spirit about my ranger work. And I had uh, tried to be a magazine writer in my 20s and really didn't get very far with it. But, uh, you know, with that, uh, in, in that crisis of what am I doing here? What, you know, I'm, that's not enough being a ranger. I kind of came back to writing as, with the idea of making a sort of campfire talk for a larger group of people beyond what I could reach, you know, a, a, at a little amphitheater in a park. And that was really my intent. Mm -hmm. and, and I started out writing very polemical kind of, didactic here's what you should all do you know uh and uh, and here's how terrible things are and uh very quickly i you know i think i was reading i was reading people like terry tempest williams and wendell berry and Ger and barry lopez and robert michael pyle and scott russell sanders and patty ann rogers the wonderful poet um and and i I very quickly was taken in by the idea of the narrative essay, narrative writing as a story, not a polemic, meaning I wasn't here to tell you what you should do. I was here to execute a story the best I could. And it seemed to me that, uh, that from there, I, I got more and more interested in people. You know, we don't, we don't really have a, a nature problem. We've got a people problem. And so that's how I kind of got into it. And, and your first book really is, is kind of an elongated fire, fireside chat, right? Telling the story of your experience in, in part having the ranger experience not exactly being that, um, you know, and that I don't know that you expected to, to kind of be tracking down meth cookers <laughs> or, you know, drug addicts in the backcountry. Um, and then you, you made this transition with Engineering Eden 
to a little more of a, an academic from a, from personal storytelling to kind of a more academic journalistic approach to really a big topic. Tell us about that transition. Well, you know, I think, um, I think uh, I've, even in Nature Noir, I don't consider myself a main character. Nature Noir concerns itself. I mean, the sort of heroic character is Dave Finch, the, the great ranger whose real name is Mike Lynch um, and, uh, and the other rangers. And I'm writing about the rangers and the people we're encountering. And I like to think of myself as just a pair of eyes reporting on what's there or what's happening. Um, uh, I think maybe I was responding to, uh, you know, my parents' generation in the 60s and 70s was very me, the me generation, you know? And, uh, and I think I wanted to, I think I had a natural aversion to um, some of these kinds of things. We occasionally see in park bookstores of like, here's the cool things I did when I was a ranger, you know? And I, I really didn't want to write like that. Um, I want to write about landscape and people's mm -hmm. relationship to landscape. Uh, so I would say I was a little reticent already in Nature Noir. Engineering Eden was definitely not a personal narrative. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's got everything in it from 1812, from the, uh, the problem of the dispensing the public lands to more or less the present. And it just, I never even thought about uh, being in it. I'm in it in the very end where I'm describing my, my work on the book. And, you know, I sort of appear at the very end, uh, but it's just not that kind of book. You right. know, it's narrative nonfiction about history. Well, and I, I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I, I, I think, um, you know, if, if you had a little piece, a little reading perhaps that you might be uh, willing to share with us? Well, you know, um, it, you know, in reading from this book, I've often read something about somebody getting killed by a bear. And I, <laughs> I sense that nobody in Glacier really wants to hear about that. <laughs> um, and, and when we talked, uh, you said you wanted me to read something about the science story, didn't you? Yeah, you know yeah that'd you be said? great. Are you, yeah. uh, are you happy that I remember that? I'm, you, I'm very happy read, to are remember you that. that? And no, no, and while, right. you're, while you're queuing that up, I, you've gotten lots of greetings from across the country. Kathy from New Jersey, Denise from Robbins, Iowa, Vince from Valley Forge, Connie from Arizona, greetings from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Whitefish, Jacksonville, Bainbridge Island, Washington, uh, Elliott City, Maryland, Austin, Texas, where it is very cold, um, 120 hours below freezing. So, um, so you you, uh, you have a, a, a national audience to to hear um, uh, some some pieces from your book. We'd really appreciate that, George. Well, that's because of the Glacier Conservancy, and you know we, we've really um, unfortunately we've had some very rough times over the last uh, little over a year. We've lost almost now coming on uh, close to half a million Americans and um, many people are suffering and so on. But this process that we're doing right now is something brand new. And uh, it's never been possible to have a, a book group with everybody's faces uh, in it, um, 120 people from all over the country who have shared tastes and interests. And I'm so happy to be with you. It's just such a thrill for me. Uh, I've never talked to a book group of 120. I've talked to or audiences bigger than that, but there's there's never been anything like that. So thank you, Doug. Oh, thank thank and, you. It's it's terrific. Um, I'll read a, a little chunk of science narrative from the book about David Graeber, who was a, a student of Starker Leopold's, uh, who kind of becomes the storyteller in the latter part of the book. Is my audio okay? Am I Great. Coming through? Okay. Graeber entered graduate school just in time to be taught the beautiful, orderly, Clementsian vision of the ecosystem as superorganism in which the various parts, plants, animals, bacteria, have co-evolved like our ears, eyes, limbs, and kidneys to work harmoniously through a series of predictable stages toward a predestined end. And he finished his graduate work 
and entered professional life just in time to see the whole thing fall apart. In July of 1973, in a paper titled simply Succession in the Journal of the Arnold Arboretum, two ornithologists, William Drury and Ian Nisbet, set out to refute the entire body of thought about succession. Drury and Nisbet were the same ornithologists who a decade before had used military radar to watch birds migrating 20,000 feet over Massachusetts at night. Drury, the senior of the two, was a research scientist for the Massachusetts Audubon Society and a lecturer at Harvard. His protege and co-author, Ian Nisbet, was a young British physicist and amateur birder. Nisbet had come to the United States to do physics research at MIT and watch birds. In the course of his birding, he encountered Drury. Drury took the young Nisbet under his scientific wing. And in 1961, they decided to see what they might do with David Lack's serendipitous World War II discovery using modern military radar. Drury, said Nisbet, had a total lack of respect for authority. He questioned everything. In the early 1970s, the two of them decided to question the sweet, harmonious vision of succession. In their 1973 paper, they investigated the claims of traditional ecology and found no evidence of complex interdependence between predictable assemblages of organisms and predest with predestined outcomes. It was all random. From there, Drury and Nisbet reviewed the work of an impressive list of other scientists whose conclusions taken collectively had already totally torn down the principles supporting succession, but without anyone really noticing it. They resurrected Henry Gleason, a contrarian early 20th century American ecologist whose work had been forgotten in the enthusiasm for succession. There is no balance of nature said Drury and Nisbet, echoing Gleason. No superorganism of species all holding hands and working together. There are only individual species with various tolerances for dryness or wetness, heat or cold, presence or absence of nutrients, sunlight or shade, forming in random combinations according to their individual needs. What seems to be a harmonious whole is just the aggregate of self-interest. There is no plan for it. There is nothing predictable or predetermined about ecology. Places like Yellowstone have no one preferred state. They might have all kinds of possible responses to chance occurrences. Drury and Nisbet had called out the beginning of the end of Clemencian succession. It took a while for the implications to filter into the offices of scientists working in national parks. But when they did, here was the problem. If a national park has no preferred state, what is our target or goal in restoring it? Yeah, that's a, that's a very powerful, uh, thank you for sharing that. It's a very powerful piece in the book and in, in, in kind of this whole discussion that we have at the Conservancy, right? And the work that we do you know, spot, supported by these amazing people that you are seeing from across the country who help us think through exactly that question. I was thinking today about one of the projects that we're working on this year um, is a Keystone Species project regarding the Clark's Nutcracker, and that comes up in your book, um, that you have this interdependence between grizzly bears who eat the cones and the seeds and the Clark's Nutcracker who buries them so we get more um, Eastern whitebark pine. Um, and, and it's really interesting to think about then how do we interact in that, right? So when you go to Canada, they're wrapping the cones so nobody can get access to the cones so they can take them. Well, that means the bear or neither the bear nor the Clark's nutcracker. Mm -hmm. So what is the natural state? So it's a mm -hmm. super important um, point. And I think we'll probably have a lot of questions about that. And now Karen Chickering, I, um, hate to call you out, but I saw you laughing um, when when Jordan was starting to speak, talking about David Graeber. Uh, we've already found that that Jordan and Karen, uh, one of Jordan's friend is Karen's cousin, 
So I'm assuming that David Graeber is also familiar to you, Karen. We're gonna un we're gonna Karen, unmute. There you go. Unmute we're gonna there. unmute you quickly. Yeah, thank you. There you go. Um, yeah, I actually don't know him. I just really loved um, the way Starker chose him uh, for as mm -hmm. a graduate student. He was a mm -hmm. mediocre biology student, dropped out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but he liked the way he thought and he liked the way he talked. And that's really it. smart of you to, to notice that. I, I love that part of the book. I love that part of the story. I didn't make that. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just love that you saw that. No, it, it, it just struck me as um, how it should be in graduate school. And, and well, Karen, you, know, you um, were, Karen, you were a student of Starker's at Berkeley. Yeah, yes, I was a student of Starker's at Berkeley. He was in the School of Forestry when I was um, in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Yeah. Amazing. He was a, well, uh, Starker, you know, was a public intellectual. And yes. so was his father, Aldo. Mm -hmm. And both men had a very strong interest, not just in talking to other scientists and making papers that other scientists read, but in talking directly to the public. This started very early for Aldo. Aldo uh, got out of uh, the Yale Forest School, went down to the south Southwest in New Mexico and Arizona. And before long, he was organizing hunters to try to have game associations to protect game, hire game wardens and so on and going out and, and speaking to groups. So the same was true for Starker. Starker was very interested in communicating with regular people. And this is what he saw in Graeber. Graeber is a, has a, I wish he was here tonight with us. I should have invited him, but uh, uh, Graeber uh, has an ability to speak in sentences that draw from history, biology, you know, geology, all the ologies, um, uh, and, 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 and form these, these interrelations of ideas. And, and so Starker thought this is a possible successor for me. Interesting. Well, we're, we're already getting a bunch of questions and so I'm gonna hand it off to Jill here in, in just a moment. I, I did want to, um, Steve just put in the, in the chat, one of the answers to the, to the discussion questions that we sent out earlier um, and he answered the question, who is your favorite character? And answered that Marion was the first bear with a collar. And that kind of mm -hmm. feeds into a narrative that we talked about a little bit earlier um, before we started, which is the first bear that you handled. Um, and, and, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about both Marion and the story and then also your first experience. Well, you know, the, um, I, it looks to me like maybe people think I'm writing uh, for some logical reason that I, <laughs> that, I, that I have some construct that I start with. I really come from feelings about things and sometimes a trouble, you know, I'm troubled about something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think I write to find out what I think and sometimes to come to some conclusion about things. Uh, so this book that we're talking about now, my second book, really has its roots in, uh, when I was a young ranger, I cross-trained with the wildlife management people to work on bears because we were in the middle of the bear wars before things really settled down. And um, so many years later, uh, I decided it might be interesting to write about this experience uh, and I went back and the bear handling records for all the bears we dealt with, uh, tranquilized, relocated, uh, put collars on them, studied where they went, drew their blood, measured them, tattooed their, the inner uh, part of their lip with a number in case the collar or the tag fell off. I went back and, and looked at the handling records for all of these bears and without, with one exception, they came to a bad end very soon after we got involved with them. Uh, the, be the best thing for a bear was to have nothing to do with people, really. They didn't live long uh, once, once we got involved with them. And as many of you know, one of the things that, that really didn't work was to move them. So it just happens that the first bear I ever worked um, 
let's see here. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I've oh, got yeah. my ba- I've got my back turned, uh, and one of the wildlife techs is across from me, and you'll see the shape of this black bear lying on an army stretcher below. So this first bear that I ever worked was the one bear that survived our manipulation. This bear got in trouble in Mineral King and Sequoia Kings Canyon. We worked it a couple of times. We put a collar on it. And then it walked to Yosemite all the way up the Sierra where it had a couple of cubs and lived for years and years. And then uh, eventually walked back down the Sierra came back to Mineral King, started breaking into cabins. And Mike Coffey, who was the uh, wildlife tech I'm in, with in that picture, went out and dug into its den and shot it when it was, um, but it lived for years. The rest of them didn't do well. Um, and that experience of going back and being sort of horrified about what ha- happened to all the bears we'd manipulated was really at the root of this book. It stayed with me for a long time. I can imagine that what a, I mean, such a visceral experience, right? And, and I mean, I think all of us that, you know, think about that. I was novices like myself and how amazing that would be. And there's a, there's a huge responsibility, I would think, uh, when you have that life in your hands, for sure. Well, we, we have our own lives in our hands. Yeah. We very, we very seldom live up to that, you know. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Yeah. Well, um, so we got some good questions, Jill. I'm going to kind of hand it off to you. Um, Jordan, I will also tell folks, Jordan has been super generous um, to offer if people would like to have a signed book plate for their book or for a book you'd like to get as a gift for someone else. If you just use the chat or email emily at emily at glacier.org, um, she'll make sure that all that information gets to Jordan. And thank you very much for, uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, get people an inscribed book um, uh, as well. So um, Jill, uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks everyone for putting in your questions. We have a couple. Um, before I kind of go down the list here, I do just want to say if anyone would like to engage personally with Jordan, please feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. Um, Jordan would love to talk with you and answer your questions directly. If you're a little shy and you just want to use the chat, that's totally fine too. I'm happy to read your questions. But um, you know, we have a bit of a larger group, but I think we can still manage it. If you would like to unmute yourself, um, please feel free. And, you know, we'd, we'd love for you to kind of use this as an opportunity to, to talk with the author. So, um, I think I see the first question is from Lisa. Um, and Lisa, if you want to unmute yourself as I'm reading your question, feel free. Um, she commented as in many areas, problems seem to arise, especially when politics get involved or politicians in particular. Um, She's wondering if you have any thoughts on that, Jordan. Is there any way that can be mitigated, avoided? Is there any way around that? Well, you know, the way way around that is uh, for a long time in American history, we had something called the bureaucracy, which was not, uh, we didn't fire everybody in charge every four years when we got a new president. We had a group of people who spent their lives doing certain kind of work, who knew what they were doing, and they were there for each administration, no matter if Republicans or Democrats were in charge. One of the challenges of the recent era, let's say for the last, well, since since the 80s, I would say, is this business of politicizing lower and lower ranks in government. Um, and this means that, um, agency missions, you know, I can't think of a mission as, as, as long range as that of the national parks. You're, you're here for perpetuity and it takes a certain stability and uh, tendency to want to pick something intelligent if you can find something and then go with it for a long time. Mm-hmm. One of the examples of that is prescribed fire and prescribed natural fire. Uh, this subject had been batted about. It started, uh, really got going under the Carter administration. It was then shut down under two administrations and so on. Um, And, you know, I think the answer to your question is we need to have people in lower ranks of government who are not having to kowtow to the coming or the changing 
administrations as they come and go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kathy, how I don't. I, I let me just say I don't think that word bureaucracy is a bad word. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly understand it as a complaint about red tape, but we need professionals in the government who do what they do. Mm -hmm. We need them to be left alone by the politicians, as mm -hmm. your as your questioner said. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for touching on that. Um, I think Kathy had a question when you were holding up that photo. She asked, did you name that bear? Can you remember if you did or not? That bear's name was Arcta. And, and you know, the, um, the, the grizzly Ursus Arcta, Arctus Americanus, wasn't it? Mm. So Arcta was the, uh, the name of that bear. And, uh, and was the only bear that survived our manipulations. Wow. <laughs> that okay. was a sad thing to read yeah. how badly this went. So Joe, I got a Jill, I got a question direct from, from Jordan. Yeah. Um, if, if, not, not Jordan asking himself a question. <laughs> Jordan, uh, one of our members, um, asking I about, do that though, you know, where's my car keys? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, whether you think, Jordan, if uh, Jack Anderson hadn't had the centennial deadline, um, would he have closed the bear dumps per the Craighead suggestion instead of, uh, instead of closing them so quickly? I don't think so. I think uh, Jack Anderson, uh, you know, perhaps to his credit, he had a chief scientist in Glenn Cole, and he did what the chief scientist wanted to do. That generally, when you take, you take what your subordinates who are, it's their job, have recommended and you do it, that's a good thing. I, uh, Glenn Cole is such an interesting character in this book. I wonder if um, the folks that are with us found that also. He's, he's not a, a hugely bad person, even though some of the things that he does to the Craigheads, like trying to get them to sign off on the false glacier fatality report, or he'd kick them out of Yellowstone, they'd lose their laboratory. That's pretty evil. But in general, he's a good man who really believed in doing a good job. He was just really wrong. And he was wrong in the way of this kind of druidic belief that nature would right itself no matter what we'd done to mess it up. Uh, and I think that he basically told his boss, here's what we ought to do. And the other thing was this guy, Aid Murray. Adolf Murray was a, a sainted biologist by that time, and he would come by headquarters and say, We've got to shut down the dumps. You know, there's no uh, one of the, his brother uh, had done a study of the uh, uh, bear eating human food problem back in 1941, and he'd come to the same conclusion. So, no, I think he probably would have done it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, while we're on the subject of the Craigheads, um, they kind of seem to be the rock stars to, to some they extent, were, they know, were, yeah. right? So, to, yeah. so give us a little little bit of, of Craighead uh, uh, background and, and they're a fascinating family. Well, I think one of the, you know, the joys of being a writer is when you get into a sort of uh, uh, trove of materials from somebody, some people like the Craigheads, as was the case with me. I, uh, the Craighead kids trusted me enough to set me loose in, in the Frank's basement and John's office. Wow. And these papers weren't accessioned mm. yet. The same was true for, uh, for uh, Starker, that I was somehow lucky enough in 2009, I think it was, to be set loose in a Starker's old office at UC Berkeley, which Karen will probably remember. It's down in the basement of Mulford Hall. Uh, when you go in the offices in, in, in this uh, basement area, go in the offices, the ground surface outside is about, well, at least weight, waist to belly height. So you look out the window and you see the undersides of the landscape plants. <laughs> was, you know, for such an, an, uh, an amazing person, it was not much of a very impressive office, you know. Uh, but but in, in that time, I was allowed to go through unaccessioned papers of Starker 
and then wrote a letter to try to get them accession. And they're now, they're now in the bankrupt. And um, so just working in that environment. And one of the last raptors that John had had was still in a cage on the property. And this old eagle just kind of sitting there all alone in this cage. And John, John by that time was approaching 100 and he, he had dementia. And uh, so I think this is the kind of thing when you're a writer that you get into a connection or contact with people who a few years later, there won't be any contact with. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I answered your question, but no, that was great. It's always it'll just do for now. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some additional questions, Jill, I've, I've noticed in, on a similar vein. So I'll mm -hmm. pass it back to you. Yeah. Well, we're on the topic of, of rock stars. Ed mentioned he thought Steven Zetterberg was a rock star as well. And he'd love to. I really do. I really do. You know, he yeah. was, uh, he was a classic liberal, not in the pejorative sense that the word is used now, but he believed in the power of the courts to right the wrongs of regular people. Steven Zetterberg was one of the first people to file a class action lawsuit against automakers when uh, the, um, at this time, the uh, Chevrolet trucks had a problem with the wheels falling off <laughs> while you were driving. And... Uh, so the manufacturer sent a letter out to the owners saying, by the way, your wheels could fall off and didn't offer a repair and didn't offer um, anything. And uh, one of those guys lived near Zetterberg's office and came in one day and complained about it. Zetterberg went out and collected a whole bunch of Chevrolet owners and actually put on this lawsuit against uh, General Motors, the great behemoth of American industry. And he's just a lovely guy. Um, and um, somehow representative. I mean, so much about American life has been soiled, including the way we think of lawyers, you know. But uh, this, this was a person who, you know, his son told me, whose son inherited his practice, said he would represent his clients until, they, until he was dead. He never gave up on trying to get what he needed for his clients. And of course he did that for Smitty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Smitty Parrott, who was injured, badly injured, almost killed in Glacier. Steven Zetterberg uh, pretty much saved his family from going bankrupt. So yeah. thank yeah, you for there, that question. Yeah, yeah. Ed just would he loved to hear more about him. So I think I think that was great. Um, and again, there were unaccessioned papers. They uh, I was working for years on this, and then uh, I kept telling Zetterberg's son, if you ever, you know, go into his papers, oh, they're in this storage space, you know, we don't have time. One day he calls me up and he goes, we're going in the storage space. <laughs> and the Smitty Parrot papers were in there. Wow. Um, yeah. That's the joy of being a writer. There's lots of it that isn't joyful. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. What else have we got? Uh, Bonnie has a good question regarding bear management, if you'd like to touch on this. Um, she's wondering um, about the differences in bear management in the you know, this is such parts. a great question because uh, I think the National Park Service really hasn't done as good a job. And I, you know, I maybe even include some of the conservancies in reporting this great success. It is one of the clearest examples of when restoration really worked. You had a population of bears in the 60s and 70s and 80s that were menacing people. I mean, did, uh, those of you who made it all the way through the book, can you imagine what was going on down in Yosemite Valley uh, and Little Yosemite at the time? All these maulings, who ever heard of maulings in Yosemite, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a mess. They were breaking into people's cars. I can remember very clearly that in, say, 1982, 83, I'd go out every morning and take four or five bear uh, break-in reports first thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. Somebody would be standing at the ranger's station when I got there. And, uh, <laughs> and this has utterly changed, utterly yeah. changed. Yeah. And, and it's something that we've done really well. And I think it would be encouraging to, to people to know about it more. Now it's just, oh, we don't have that problem anymore, or it's not much of a problem. So, 
Sure. Yeah. Have, have you um, noticed in your experience differences in that management between Western parks and Eastern parks? Any variances there? You know, I have to tell you, I don't know much about Eastern parks. I'm a Westerner mm -hmm. and I have yeah. the classic failings of um, Westerners. I really don't know what's beyond the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Western yeah. exceptionalism. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know so where I'm Bonnie sorry. is. But, I but, I, but I, yeah. I do know that, you know, the black bear problems back east were just as bad. Sure. Uh, the, you know, black bear behavior isn't really any different. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, I was just places say, like Shenandoah, Shenandoah had a terrible time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, on, I'm in Ohio and being near the Smokies. You got muted somehow. Oh. Say that again. Looks like she's not muted. I don't. Maybe her. Okay, I, just a bad internet that. connection. Yeah. Okay, try that again. We're waiting. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Can hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm from Ohio, and being in the Smoky near the Smokies, we have a, a terrible problem called Gatlinburg, mm. uh, <laughs> and it it just there's a way there's still a lot of bear people human interaction, sure. and I think people kind of take it for granted because they're not grizzly bears, but you could be in Gatlinburg and have a bear stroll past the pancake pantry um, very easily. So I was just wondering if there, there was a huge difference because the Smokies is such a different monster with so many people there. No, it's not, it's no different. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that the uh, bear problem has been taken care of. When you were talking just now, I presume you're talking about you know, dwellings or houses outside the park. Um, in the suburbs, it has not been taken care of. We have, you know, we have a big bear problem in the suburbs all over. It's just really hard to get people to do what they're supposed to do when they're not in a federal jurisdiction, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, no, I, I think the problem is the same and it's, it's uh, food conditioning and habituation. So I wonder if the audience, if all of you know the difference that there's two aspects of bear management. One is that you cannot let them get human food, right? Mm -hmm. That's the problem of food conditioning. It is one of the most powerful things you can do to give a treat to an animal. It's so powerful that if you withdraw the treat, they still want to come around for it. Uh, and uh, and if you cause them pain, as was some of this ha uh, hazing that's been done to get bears to stop coming to places where they're people, they will undergo pain to get that reward mm. gladly. You know, when I was in, starting out, they were using rock salt on bears. Later, it was rubber bullets. But um, so, you know, the key element is not letting them get that first food. The other thing about habituation is the interesting problem that we have not just with bears, but with all kinds of animals when they get comfortable around people. Being comfortable around people saves animals stress, slows down their metabolism so they don't burn as much resource. Uh, and it's actually you know, positive for the animal's body to not be constantly stressed out by being around people. The problem is, is that when you get citizens and animals close together, when a bison gets really comfortable grazing by a fence line and people come down within five, six feet of it, sooner or later, it's taking out the fence to crush the person. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the two elements that we have. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for touching on that, Bonnie. It's interesting to hear that perspective in Ohio and, and Tennessee. Um, let's see. We have another question moving down the list. Um, you talk about the weight of bears being fed by people versus bears eating naturally. Yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a bear when I was at Sequoia King Canyon called Kong for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for King Kong. And it was famous for opening the lids of dumpsters that were locked down. Um, yeah, they get bigger when they're fed on, on human, on garbage. Or yeah. 
Yeah, th this uh, particular uh, mom Serrano, we have her in in the in the Zoom chat. Under, um, she's wondering, are weights starting to kind of like even out and find this more natural state now, uh, like in today's in in um, the national parks? Yeah, outside, yeah, probably not. Yeah, we still have a lot of problems outside the parks, and you know, bears are interesting. They're, uh, I'm sorry, black bears are interesting in that. They're one of these species like crows and ravens that lives really well with people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't seem to suffer from being around people. So there's a lot of suburban bears now. Yeah. Yeah. We've got about 15 minutes left. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. And, and, and then um, my family ends, right? <clears throat> right. Then you're, well, you're always, you, you will never be rid of us. You now are officially a member of the Glacier family, whether you like it or not, um, uh, Jordan. But, um, you know, it's just, it's terrific to find this connectivity between your book and the work that um, the Conservancy supporters allow us to do um, this year. And we're very excited. We're going to be able to continue some wilderness character mapping. We're getting a grant application actually from the park this week um, to think about how do we continue, right? Knowledge is power. And what we, we don't know what we don't know in certain parts of the park about what the wilderness looks like. What are, what are the characteristics? And so um, we've asked the park to dream big and we have a donor group that we hope will be responsive to um, funding some character mapping. So stay tuned, you'll probably be hearing about that um, soon. And, and it's neat to be able to connect something that we're doing in 2021 and 2022 with the park to your book and history that tells us that's the right thing to do. So um, it's really neat to be able to, to connect that um, together and to be able to, to have that discussion for sure. Well, you know, in, in what you've just said, first of all, the, uh, the associations and the conservancies and so on have been an, an amazing you know, development in this time. They used to be fairly stodgy little bookstore operations uh, and uh, they're doing all kinds of exciting things now. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're, they have great professionals working with them and they're doing things that the park service can't do as easily. Sometimes the park service needs something and it's just this endless purchasing problem to get it and conservancy can get it. Um, so um, thank you for the great work you do. And I can tell you've got support here. You know, in the last thing you said, you mentioned the word connected or connectivity twice in what you just said. And that was really the other root of this book um, other than the, and you know, the, the thing about the subject of national parks in general is it sort of gets sucked into the great black hole called bears. And have you ever seen a bear? Did you ever get chased by a bear? And some, some audiences I can never get out of it. But, but the other route to this other than the bear route uh, was this work was this idea of connectivity. I felt like I, I, I had decided to see if I could write a story that focused on the connectivity of everything in the story, landscapes, people, ideas, animals, plants. And I wanted to tell the story in a way where it formed a model of how ecology works uh, that in a story form. In other words, uh, you're nodding, so I must be making some sense. I don't feel like totally. it, but I wanted to build a story that that was made like the uh, third century Buddhist notion of Indra's net, the net of connectivity where everything in the universe is connected. And that is why I told this, this story the way I did in this book. Do we have that slide, Emily? Mm -hmm. Sure thing, uh, one second. I'm sorry? Yep, hold on one sec. Yeah, sure. I'll pull that up for you. And I think my audio will still come through. And so I'll mm -hmm. just. Uh, Good. Um, so, so I set out uh, and I began drawing maps of all the things I was doing at the time. And this is one of my notebooks from 2009. You can see the word Graber uh, on the left-hand page about the middle. There's the word right above it is Starker. 
and you can see the bold line between those two men. That was at the center of the book. There were all kinds of other things I was doing. You know, I, I tell people when I, when I started this book, I went on this big walkabout. I wanted to know a lot about wilderness and national parks that I didn't know yet, even though I'd been a ranger for 21 years. So I went to the Arctic twice, you know, on this book. There's nothing in the book about the Arctic that I can remember. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Super interesting. Thank you for the slide. Um, we can go back if you can extract it. Um, so, you know, I think the thing that we need to do is to, is to teach our children and our young people to think in complicated ways. One of the things I notice about the terror we've just been through is that the people who went there and beat up cops and broke into things and stuff had very simple kind of notions. It's very straightforward and simple. And it, you could put it down in five words. And I think what we need to do is to think in more complicated ways. And we need to notice when you go back to this work you're talking about, Doug, about wilderness character, to notice the connections between things. And that's what I tried to write in a story, not telling you, every, hey, everything's connected, but to actually put it in the story. So you have David Lack, this English guy, English ornithologist, turns up in the beginning uh, where he works on radar in World War II, and he's trying to figure out, or he's brought in to figure out what are these strange signals that are getting in the way of detecting German bombers coming over the channel? Well, they were birds migrating at night. So then David Lack work is carried on by the two guys I mentioned when I did the reading. And then later in the book, suddenly David Lack has written this book called uh, Natural Regulation, which becomes the way that Glenn Cole manages Yellowstone. I wanted to put all these connections in and see if, if it's possible to tell a story the way that we need to see the world now. You know, Martin Luther King says, um, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. Uh, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. You know, Wendell Berry says, every life has all lives for its delight. Um, you know, that's what I tried to put in the form of the book. I don't know if I succeeded. Wow, that is that. That's very. And I leaned over to write down, um, you know, teach our young people to think in complicated ways. I mean, I think that you really is. And that the book to me, that that's a great way of describing the book because I, I really think it's a, just a, such a rich uh, telling of a complicated story in a way that demonstrates um, that connectedness. Um, I have a little surprise gift for, for someone. Emily, if you could uh, pick me a name at some point between now and the next five minutes um, and just give that to me. I have a, a little surprise gift that um, I'm one of those serial readers who when I read a book and the book refers to other books, I have to read all of those other books. Um, so it's always problematic. But um, so and Jill, I think we have time still for a couple of more questions. I know we have a couple. Yeah, I'd love to try and knock off a couple here. Um, Myrna would love to pick your professional knowledge of bears, of course. Um, their hunting dog pointed out a bear den about 200 yards from their house last week. So she's wondering if a bear makes its den within a short distance of three homes, does that mean the bear is pretty acclimated to humans? And they do have a lot of bears there in the spring and summer, especially they have like cherry orchards and um, things like that nearby. So she's just wondering, is, is this bear acclimated or? What state is she in? Ooh, that's a good question. Myrna, could you let us know what state you're in? Well, I'll tell you the answer to your question is, ask the state warden where you are. Don't ask me. <laughs> I'm in Montana. Uh, yeah, ask I'm the state. You know, the state of Montana has done a wonderful job of working with the park service. Uh, as I see it, maybe that's not so for some of you, but uh, the effort on bear management is very much meshed um, in an impressive way. I, I went out with a couple of those people and was impressed and ask your state warden. 
Well, and it's it's funny that Myrna would be the questioner because Myrna is the uh, the random generator has generated Myrna as the winner of our contest, um, which no is way, great. Really? So so Myrna, I was really taken by the by the Craigheads, and so they wrote a book which which Jordan refers to called um, How to Survive at Land and Sea. Great. Uh, so so I got a first edition copy of this, which I will gladly send you. Um, it's it has the price in it. In 1946, it sold for two dollars. So, so it's on its way. Thank you. <laughs> My husband will appreciate it too. He's very good. An You're ecologist, just... and he's attending tonight too. He heard there the Craighead speak long ago. Okay. Oh, well, well, this will come in handy in case you get Thank lost. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Can we squeeze in any more questions? I love the questions. Yeah, let's yeah. try to squeeze it. We have a few more. Um, just going down the list here. Eric is asking, do you think the court cases against NPS has led to potentially over exuberance of protective precautions in the parks now? Well, you know, um, I love the courtroom. I love the, I love being able to write a courtroom drama um, I've spent a lot of time in courtrooms, you know, in my work as a park ranger, law enforcement ranger, and I came to know portions of the law pretty well. I could write a decent search warrant and search warrant <laughs> affidavit uh, to go, um, you know, kick a door down and arrest a car burglar or something. <laughs> um, I spent 14 years as a certified instructor in the use of force. Um, and uh, the courtroom it, as a symbol in the in this story and, and perhaps in, in, in the other stories the questioner is asking about is kind of a finding of truth, you know, when truth still mattered, when it, we didn't have public officials just going and spouting bald faced lies, but when truth mattered, the idea of a court in a free society is where we find out what's true and what isn't, um, or at least we try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, the law is the witness and external deposit of our moral life. Its history is the history of our moral development. Uh, just so, in the same way, the national parks represent this external deposit of our ecological development. And, you know, part of what I'm doing is writing these sort of hopeful tragedies because the news about our capacity to get it about nature is not good, right? People ask me sometimes when I do these talks, how in the world could they have allowed themselves to feed the bears as an entertainment? Or how could they have shot all the predators? And the answer is, how can this civilization live with the idea uh, of climate change right now and do so little? As, a, as a, So this is the same us. And uh, you know, the Park Service, to answer the question, the Park Service is buffeted by these occasional lawsuits. I have not seen the Park Service really overreacting. They still like, allow people to, to climb big walls all over the national parks. You know, um, they, uh, they allow people to go out in the wilderness uh, and do the things they do. No, I don't think so. Um, maybe I'm wrong. And, and I think that given the robust discussion, Jill, I don't think I'm going to get any criticism for going a, a couple of minutes over time if we were to squeeze in another question. Sure. Yeah, Lana has a great one here since we've been on the topic of connectivity. She said, given that bears and other animals don't recognize political boundaries, what are the implications of the hodgepodge of different management philosophies with That's state? a great, that's a really great question. Boy, yeah, with all the know, different... Uh, all Doug told me that this uh, book group is inhabited by smart people, and I kind of get it. <laughs> uh, the, among the most hopeful things that are happening in this world that we're talking about is the uh, large landscape view that's happening between agencies and jurisdictions. And the, what, what you know used to be called the crown of the continent ecosystem. What do you guys call it now? What's it called now? Northern Rockies ecosystem. Yeah, we refer so we we refer to it as the crown of the crown of the crown continent. of the continent. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I did some field work, obviously in Glacier, and my time in Glacier goes back to the seventies. Um, I have walked and snowshoed in begin in late winter, early spring from the Canadian border 
down into the Lewis, Lewis and Clark National Forest and down through the Bob Marshall in one walk. Um, and, you know, the perception of large landscape across boundaries is an incredibly hopeful thing. And it, it's happening up in the Northern Rockies. It's happening with the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. It's what will give species the ability to move north as they need to, uh, or to move into different environments as they need to. And um, that's the answer to this, this balkanization. It's already happening. The Craigheads were really among the first people to think it up. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem was a Craighead idea, pretty much. Yeah, and I mean, I noted, and I forget where it was in the book, but you just very clearly, like right when they put the got the first collaring information, they're like, well, that solves it. We yeah. have to have larger ecosystems. Yep. And that was like 1961, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So, and, so the and again, the same us, yeah. Yep. That's right. The missiles in space business created these sub these small micro devices that would make it possible to hang a radio around a bear's neck and for it to survive this rough treatment, that's missiles, right? Missiles need to have electronics that won't shake themselves to pieces. So you get this radio and out of that radio comes the knowledge of where bears are really going. And out of that knowledge comes this enlarging of ecosystems to include state and national jurisdictions and private land and so on. Um, that's the historical story. And it always helps when you make those connections and we see the connection, the strange connection between the missile and space business and what we now know about animals crossing boundaries. Well, and people, um, you know, conservancy supporters are going to hear a lot more from us. We're making a focus uh, group right now on wildlife connectivity with the park. Um, you'll be hearing a lot more. That could be a very big project uh, um, over the next three to five years from uh, for us. Send us another wolverine. Wilderness. If you well, can, the, the, it, so there, there may be Wolverine. So keep, stay tuned. Um, we've been working very hard on a, a Wolverine project, on a on a connectivity project uh, for Y to Y. Um, so uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot planned. And um, before you go, we can't let you go without asking, what do you have planned next? What are we going to read from you next, Jordan? I'm working on a book about fire now, and it's it's the same kind of narrative nonfiction, more like nature noir. Um, I was briefly, you know, involved in Wildland Fire when I first started, and um, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm doing another narrative nonfiction book about about fire. We are we are so honored to have had you spend some time with us tonight. Thank you for the generous gift of your of your time and 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 expertise and and treasure. I really appreciate it. And we, you, I think you can rest assured that you've got the first hundred book sales done for the fire book right here tonight. <laughs> um, and there, there's many a guest room, guest cottage um, uh, room here in Glacier um, with your new family. So thank uh, you. Jordan, Jordan Fisher Smith, thank you for joining us and, and people thanks. here in the book club. Thanks. Uh, next month is um, People Before the Park, super, super exciting, interesting book, whole different story, but a lot of connectivity about one of the things we didn't get to talk about, about taking a natural place and making it a cultural place and whose culture. So, oh, we um, forgot to talk about that. Yeah. So, well, we, we, we may have to have, we just have to have you part back two. or when they, yeah, part, part two, or when they have you down at, when they, when they have you down at uh, Grand Canyon, we'll just all join that one too. <laughs> Good. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate everyone. Um, thanks for your support of the Conservancy. Uh, Jordan Fisher Smith, thanks so much for uh, being a part of our family. Thank you for having me. It was really my pleasure. I, I got to tell you, this is a wonderful environment you've created. Well, thank you. We, we, uh, we, we like being around each other and uh, love this park that has meant so much to all of us. And uh, it's great to be able to throw in together to support it. So uh, thanks for being a part of it. Thank you. Take All care. Right. Take good care, care everybody. Everyone. Be safe. Peace. Thanks so much, Jordan. Thanks, everyone. Awesome.